Super fun show today. No, it's just not my voice. A very familiar voice if you're a true Michigan State fan of the kickoff show. Yes, Dalton Shetler, he joins the show talking the biggest storylines of fall camp coming up. Also, what happened at Big Ten Media Days that he saw. Let's go. You are Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners, how on earth are we all doing today as well? Hey, if you're listening Wednesday, fall camp kicking off for your Michigan State Spartans. Oh my, like, hey, football is is coming, but good God, the summer flew by. I can't believe it. Uh, I am super stoked for this show because, hey, this is a man's voice who I feel like I've heard no less than 100 times. He is the host of the MSU football kickoff show on game days of the Spartan Media Network. Dalton Shetler. Dalton, how on earth are we doing, man? We doing okay? I'm feeling great. And I'm with you. We're ready for football season. I'm sad about summer going by too, but I know. I'm I'm just glad your ears haven't started bleeding if you've actually listened to me a hundred times. <laughs> so we're we're doing good. But no, all serious, Matt. I mean, you've been one of my favorite Twitter follows for some time. I always enjoy Appreciate the content you, you yeah. put out. So I'm I'm glad to be with you here today. <laughs> Hey there. No, I appreciate that. And like you, obviously you host a kickoff show, but you're a guest on this show. It, how can we make this comfortable for you? Because this is a, a turn of the tables here for you, man. I mean, you're, you're on, you're on offense now or defense. Like we'll see how That's this interview cool. goes, but it's going to be one or the other. Yeah. I'll just stay on the balls of my feet, Matt. We'll be good. That's yeah. <laughs> excellent. There we go. Well, I, you're no stranger to interviews, of course, you know, every single game day, but Hey, last week you were just at big 10 media days and look Michigan State by and large does a really good job of keeping things buttoned up you know they don't have a lot of quotes that trickle out there that grab headlines so they play it they play it pretty tight over there in East Lansing but with that said in your conversations with either Mel or any of the players that went down there was there anything that was said that jumped out to you as like huh that's interesting huh I thought there were a couple things, and I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to end up probably reiterating or being a bit redundant a little bit later on when we talk about some other things. But sure. one of the things that grabbed me the the most was talking with Mel and the, the question of the offensive line I, I posed to him and said, you know, he last couple of years it's been pretty thin on depth and that instantly got his attention where he's nodding along. And I asked about this year because there's so many more offensive linemen. And uh, the the spring roster has 19 linemen listed. And and that's where he started. And he goes, you know, because I was asking, what, where does that death make a difference? Is it practice? Is it, wait, where does it make a difference? And he goes, we just were a short while back having five offensive linemen on this roster. And we had to take two walk-on defensive ends and flip them to the offensive line is what he said. And, And he goes, so that's going to make a major difference, being able to have that kind of death, being able to roll so many deep. And then he also said, you know, there were times last year I just looked out on the field and said, we're just not a big football team. Like, we just okay. don't have the size. And and so he, he said that was a big point of emphasis. And as laser focused as you kind of know that face that Mel gets when he's really grabbed onto something, he yeah. kind of shot that across the table and said, that won't be a problem anymore. Like, so he, he's confident that there is size in the depth with the offensive line and what that will do for this team. Yeah, even on the defensive line, too, because he said as much, like, you know what, they got Dre Butler, they got Jared Jackson, and then they got, well, Jalen Sami, who, Dalton, you could tape both me and you together, and we are still half of what Jalen Sami looks like. <laughs> this is a mammoth of a human coming in from Colorado, so thrilled to have him, but... Yeah, it's just, you know, of course you're going to be talking positive if you're the coach, especially in the mm-hmm. preseason too. But, like, we've been doing a lot of this on the show lately, the last week since media days. Like, what's fact? What is fiction? I feel like that's fact. And, you know, he showed it by getting these kids out of the transfer portal and actually having, like you said, 19 offensive linemen. This kind of gets me fired up. But how good are you in your experience just being in the media of, like, dissecting – Coach, speak from what is actually reality. Like, do you think you have a firm grasp on that, or is Mel Tucker still pretty good at playing a good poker face? 
Oh, and, and look, I mean, you're right. Every coach, everybody's undefeated in Indianapolis just a week ago. Uh-huh, so yes. everybody <laughs> feels good. Everybody's positive. So you're you're right. But I do think there were hints of real authenticity. And I felt like one where it came through was the offensive line. Uh, I, I thought there were a couple more when talking about the defensive front seven. You started talking about the defensive line. But this linebackers unit that's that's getting ready to roll out there for Michigan State is going to be very good. And Cal Halliday just was put on the Nagurski watch list. Um, I mean, Darius Snow, Aaron Brule, we can go through the linebackers. I think Phil Steele actually has the, the Michigan State linebackers ranked 13th best in the country by, by position unit group. So, like, what Sweet. Michigan State has for a front seven up front, I think not only can it be really good, I think that's the calling card for Michigan State football this season. And Mel was pretty amped up talking about that group, too. Right on. And obviously, you know, they brought uh, experienced players down there as well, like guys like Trey Mosley. Uh, J.D. Duplain was another guy that came down. And that's the quote that I heard where, yeah, I didn't say like, oh, wow, that's kind of out there. That's shocking. I I think there was some truth in this, but he called last year a quote unquote fluke. Five and seven, of course. Hey, this is going to be everyone's 200th time hearing this stat. On the defensive side of the ball, 27 different starters last season. Uh, Look, I'm not a football genius, but that's not how you win. Uh, (laughs) That's not how you win over the course of the season, Dalton. Do you think that fluke is the correct term to put on last year, or is there another word that sticks out to you? I mean, did, or did Deplane just nail it with that one? Um, if if I'm speaking personally, I don't know if fluke is a word I'd say, but it, I'd say it was adversity filled overwhelming. I'd probably sure. find a better <laughs> phrase for that. But between the yeah. the injuries, between suspensions, between lack of consistency, being able to get the the same guys to play the same positions, different things. I I just think it was an overwhelming surge of adversity that just at the end of the day was too much for a team to overcome and and even, you know, get into the postseason, some different things. So I think with a more normal quote unquote year ahead and where you maybe see some of that consistency, you see some development. I think that's where this team maybe shows its real self a bit more because I don't believe last year was a, a true resemblance of the team and the talent that was there. And now I think in certain spots, you might even have more talent thanks to some of that depth, like we talk about with the trenches. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a real opportunity to showcase what Michigan State football really is in this time period, uh, maybe getting rid of some of those adversity-filled situations. Yeah, I, the word I would use is just annoying. <laughs> Whether it can just be injuries, <laughs> injuries, or, or the tunnel, you know, incident that happened that that shaved off eight more players. Uh, it was like ah, just me, just being the immature fan. I was just uh, annoyed, annoyed yep. Dalton. <laughs> hey, you know what? Fluke's not a bad word either. But I, yeah, it's hopefully we just return to somewhat baseline of normalcy here. Uh, yep. I don't think that's asking a lot. Uh, or, I don't know. Maybe this. Who's to say? S- to see how the next, you know, four months uh, unfold in East Lansing. But I want to get to the top five storylines going into this fall camp that is kicking off here. But first, like just for the rest of the Big Ten, because you are not at media days just to talk to Spartans. Like you guys had Nebraska mm-hmm. coach Matt Rule on. I think you had an Iowa player on. You guys, first of all, like how does that work? Like are you guys basically just waving people down like you're hailing a cab? And <laughs> Second of all, like who was the most interesting person you talked to uh, that was not wearing the green and white there? Ooh, well, I'll answer the first part. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I believe some stations have started just to wave people down and hail like a cap. That's not the way you're supposed to necessarily okay. do this. So, okay. but, but on Radio Row, yeah, it's been experienced the last couple of years. But uh, what we do is we fill out forms to or send out emails to SIDs of all the different universities, get in touch okay. with them, see what the availability is kind of looking like, and just try to coordinate from there. Um, interesting people that we talk to. Uh, honestly, I came away really struck by Matt Rule. You mentioned uh, the photo yeah. of him on social media. The conversation we had, and and like you kind of alluded to, there's so much coach speak and so much of just that fodder at, at this time period. But there was such an authenticity to, to what Matt Rule had to say. It was so transparent. I found that very genuine. Be right back with our guy Dalton Shetler here in a hot second. But first... Hey, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and 
my favorite part, for free. Gang, it is so easy to post your job. Even a schmuck like me can do it. So add your job, the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you would like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions. That's right. They apply. And hello, old friend. It's home field apparel. You already know if you're watching on YouTube, I'm rocking one of my favorite home field shirts. And if you saw on Twitter, well, they are having a new line drop for Michigan State this Saturday. Go check it out at homefieldapparel.com. I almost fell out of my chair when I saw the gruff golfing Sparty shirt they are about to drop. But even just before that, I, like, look, the shirt I'm wearing, an ode to the 2000 national title team. I was rocking my block S old school shirt yesterday. And the best part, I mean, as if the designs aren't great enough from Home Field Apparel, gang, when you put these shirts on, it is like you are putting a cloud on your body. As good as they look, they feel even better on your skin. So what are you waiting for? If you're a state fan, incredible lineup dropping this Saturday. Or, hey, they got 150-plus colleges to choose from if you like more than Michigan State. So go to homefieldapparel.com. One more time, homefieldapparel.com. Um, one of the interviews that I've come to love every single year is uh, the the founder, or not the founder, but the uh, the president of the Peach Bowl, uh, Gary Stokin. Oh, okay. Sure. It, which, of course, Gary has great things to say about Michigan State from the, the game against Pittsburgh there. But he always has some really unique thoughts. And, and one that he shared, and this is probably going to open up a door to a topic that we probably don't have time to fully dive down into. But he's yeah, got we'll a great <laughs> he's got a great sports marketing background, too. He used to work with some of the different apparel uh, vendors and, and companies within sports. And so he's, he's got this great background to, to kind of shed some light on some different things. And we were talking about, you know, the business of college athletics today, because right mm -hmm. now, like as we're sitting there talking, it was Colorado leaving the PAC 12 back to the big 12. We're talking about conference realignment. Everybody's chasing the, the dollar. And he said, you know, what's really interesting about it. College football is the second most popular sport in this country. People love college football. The NFL's first, college football right after. Uh, he says the NFL, if you take a look at what they do with their TV contracts and everything, they're probably generating about $10 billion. $10 billion. Oh, okay, now, that's okay. <laughs> you, right. And then you look at college football and you add up what all the different conferences are doing. You're probably getting to about $3 billion. Okay. And he said... That $7 billion margin should not exist that way. And so what was fascinating is he kind of opened the eyes to everybody right now is like trying to climb over each other to, to be a part of this mega conference, super conference race to make sure that they're getting a, a pretty nice piece of the pie. But if college football, and as he says, had a, a commissioner, like college football had its own commissioner separate of the NCAA and could unify and unite all these different schools and conferences Instead of letting the networks dictate the TV packages to the schools and the conferences, it could be the other way around. And he estimates $7.5 billion could be on the table for college football. So it was well. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fascinating to think that all these schools are, are trying to climb over the top of each other and just trying to get a, a bigger chunk of the, the $3 billion that currently exists. When if yeah. it was more unified maybe it could be up more than double. It could be up 250%, according to somebody who knows the industry extremely well. I thought that was sure. mind-blowing uh, coming from that those media days. But uh, I'll leave you with the other interview I thought was fascinating was, and this is this is going to hurt Spartan fans a little bit. No, um, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It's It was Blake Corum. Blake Corum was very down-to-earth. Yeah, the, the role was role always appropriate. Because especially, you know, in the rivalry, you you – it hurts when you start to to see that there's some good people on the other side and it kind of makes it more yeah. humanized. And with Blake Gorham, that was the case. I, I got to meet Jalen Rose like 10 years ago and he obviously played before, you know, my days, if you will. But I, I just grew up to know to like not like the guy and like a two minute conversation with him. I was like, he's 
nice. He's he's a great guy. Look what that, that sucks. Like, I had man, I, I had this whole <laughs> mental structure, and you just tore right. it down. Yeah, no, I, right? I completely get it. I know it, it was one one of those devastating moments of my fanhood as a Spartan, <laughs> uh, talking with Jalen Rosen, realizing that he's actually a good dude. I know, de- devastating, but. Let's get to the storylines here because, look, whether people are listening Wednesday, Thursday, fr- it is the beginning of fall camp, and it is the season to make it rain with storylines in East Lansing. Dalton, I'm sorry. I hate to do this for a guest, but, like, I gave you homework. And I said, like, hey, maybe you come in with your five storylines. We'll riff about it. And so if, if you just want to go either start at number one or number five, I'm accommodating. You, you can do whatever you want here. But okay. let's, let's, just ch- let's just chop these down, Dalton, because, God, it's – Football's back. It's back. This is exciting. Fo- football is back, and there's going to be so many different things to kind of get in the weeds to with some of these storylines. But I'll start with maybe what's the least sexy, if you'll say, of, of mm-hmm. the storylines I've got going into the, the football season. But I think it's important that people aren't talking about. Uh, according to Phil Steele's like, schedule difficulty, Michigan State has the third most difficult schedule in the country this upcoming season. There's only three true home Big Ten games this year. So the yep. point being, we used the word adversity for other reasons last year uh, to talk about that season. There's going to be adversity in this season with the third toughest schedule in all of college football. So yep. I think heading into fall camp, and this is why it's maybe not so sexy because it's really hard to get an answer on this. It's a hard gauge to read, but I think the chemistry, the leadership, those things need to really be ironed out and amplified during this fall camp heading into the year. That way they're able to respond to that adversity because I mean, it's, it's a gauntlet in front of this team this year. Yeah. And just having Washington week three is fascinating. And I was listening to an interview on part of my take uh, with Dan Campbell, you know, Lions head coach, of course, the other day. And Dan Campbell brought up that the beginning of the season is more about like who makes the least amount of mistakes early on. And look, you're breaking in a new starting quarterback, new receivers. Like, I, you got to learn quick here before you get into that week three game against Washington, which, hey, look, it's at home, Michigan State, depending where you look. But FanDuel has that five and a half point underdogs for your Spartans. And, well, look, Penix, he's 32 years old. He's played college football, God, since <laughs> Jeff Smoker was at Michigan State. They also got three other first round draft picks as of now in the mock drafts. But yeah, Washington saw last year is a very, very good team. So I just. How hard or how quick can you tighten things up here if you're Michigan State against the Chips and the Spiders? So that's – yeah, that schedule is going to be fun, Dalton. But that's a great that, – that, that's a great <laughs> one to kick things off. Uh, number number four then, if we're going to work our way backwards, I like that. Well, and, and I think this goes to something we talked about earlier with the offensive line. With 19 offensive line on that spring roster being so deep – can we return to pound green pound last year? Uh, yeah. Michigan state ran for 113 yards a game. That was the 12th best in the big 10, 111th in the country. And in, in an offense with some question marks in some different positions, I think you need to create and establish a, a solid running game to, to kind of maybe even lean on at times. And yeah. I, I think maybe with that offensive line depth, that might be able to change that. And if, if, you get a good answer there from up front and a good push. I think that changes things for Michigan State in terms of expectations for the year if they're able to run the ball effectively. Yeah, I went crazy and like someone asked for my five boldest predictions. And number one off the top, I said, we're going to double our rushing yards from last year. Now, is that crazy? Like, could I be accused of being on some serious psychedelic drugs when I said that? Like, sure. Maybe. <laughs> like, that is a that it is a big number. Like, Michigan that State is a big has number. attained it. It's a big number. But if not double it, then like I think they're going to have a dramatic increase from last year at least. And really, like if you're breaking in the new quarterback, some new receivers, I, let's just go back to how well the play action was in 2021. I mean, is there kind of Walker back there? I, probably not. I think really highly of Jalen Berger and Nathan Carter. But if you can make the run game your emphasis with all the offensive linemen as well, like I, I, I think that's going to help these new quarterbacks here, new receivers. I mean, so I. Yeah, I, I'm I'm so high in the offensive line just from numbers and experience too because well I you, you know the names on there you know Nick Samak JD Duplain yep. good for starters so I like that God, this, this this is great Dublin look, look at you you're <laughs> you're, you're, acing, you're acing the homework so far this this is already more more than I could have asked for this is this is great I have not aced a homework assignment in some time so I'm <laughs> glad to hear that but uh, for for number three of the storylines I, I think it's an important one and obviously it was talked a lot about by Michigan State fans, by coaches, so on and so forth. But the kicking game last year, I mean, we we know what it was. Yeah. What kind of change does that under, undergo when you bring in the North Carolina transfer, Jonathan Kim, who 
at North Carolina, for some of the Spartan fans who may not be quite uh, familiar with, he was a kickoff specialist. So he didn't have mm-hmm. a ton of place kicking duties. Now, he seems to be very confident. And you also, by the way, bring uh, Rusty back. Rusty's back kicking for Michigan State sure. again this year. Um, but bringing Jonathan Kim in, how big of a difference does it make? Is he ready to go in this different kind of role? And can you trust the the field goal unit? Because if you can, I mean, obviously we know how that affected some games uh, late in the mm-hmm. season last year. I, th- I think that makes a big difference and one of the big questions out there. That's why fireball sales spiked over here at the Sheehan household was the kicking <laughs> from last Is that year. why? So, uh, it, That's the only reason? It, it, it's, it, it's a reason. Maybe not the reason, but it, it certainly didn't help things. Uh, no, like, you, so I, I thought that's where you're going to go when you start talking about, like, lack of sex appeal for your first storyline. Because if you, if you watch just the driest storyline to talk about, but something that we talked about a little bit ago here is kickoffs specifically. Not just field goals, but also kickoffs. Mm-hmm. Look, Jonathan Kim, he led the ACC in uh, touchback percentage. I almost said turnover percentage. Touchback percentage. Michigan State was second to last last year in the conference. They also gave up the second most returning yards last year, only behind Ohio State, well, who had double the kickoffs Michigan State had because they scored an unholy clip. That's a long way of saying that. The kickoffs hurt Michigan State last year, so get yourself a guy that could boot it out of the back of the end zone. So, like, okay, no one thinks of kickoffs. No no one sane sits there on their days and just (laughs) thinks, you know, hey, what? I wonder how kickoffs are going to be for Michigan State this year. But, hey, here on Lock on Spartans, we hit all angles of all <laughs> stories. So, it, whether it just be the field goal unit because Dalton got like, – again, like, we we all know how bad it got. We all know how bad it got. Uh, but it's kickoffs tough. is going to be another storyline, too, to, to watch out for. I, gosh, I'm glad you brought up kicking because, like, I got some things written down, too. Kicking is 100% written in all caps on my notes. So, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you said it before I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I do want to go with number two because you might have had a little bit of foreshadowing here where you, you almost said turnover percentage instead of touchback percentage. Ah, yeah. We we talked about the calling card for this year's team, at least in my eyes, is that front seven for Michigan State's defense. And I think if the front seven is not just good or great as it's expected to be and, and should be, if it is a game changer and creates turnovers – that's where Michigan State in 2023 will hit its its ceiling of expectations. Whatever the ceiling number is of wins you have, I think if that front seven becomes special and dominant, not just good mm-hmm. or great, I think that changes things. And, and a couple of numbers I jotted down. If you go through the first uh, eight games last year, Michigan State had forced 11 turnovers at that point in time. The final four games, Michigan State only forced one turnover in the final month of the cool. season in 2022. <laughs> okay. And wow. and a big part of that is the eighth game was Michigan. And we know suspensions followed that Jacoby Winman played just those first eight games. Winman had one interception, six forced fumbles in a fumble recovery in those first eight games. I, I think you bring him back in, you support the rest of, of the, the crew around him with some of the great playmakers there are. I think there's a chance for that defense, not just to be good, great, but to be special, as we said. I'm going to go off on kind of a tangent here. Like, am I Mm -hmm. crazy for thinking that like, is Jacoby Winman a little slept on this year? Like, is he going in a little underrated? Maybe not by state fans, but because look, Cal Halliday, he gets named on the Nagurski watch list and that's for the best defensive player in the country. And Cal Halliday, look, returning leading tackler in the big 10, like very understandable how he got it. But you read a lot of these like preseason previews and like Jacoby Winman is also like almost an afterthought for a lot of these, like, Am I, am I crazy or is he actually a little no. underrated going into this year? No, I, I I, genuinely, I was reading through some magazines today and I genuinely wondered if people just forgot that, that right. Jacoby Winman is back. Like I, I, yeah. I am absolutely with you. What he did, he was on pace to, to tear apart fumble records for Michigan State in a yes. single season. And, and of course we know what happened, but. Yeah, no, this is this is somebody who can absolutely be that difference maker that that we're kind of talking about. So I'm I'm totally with you there. Okay, so I'm crazy, just not for that reason. That's good to know. Right. Yes, we, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're narrowing it down to other issues, so that's good. At least we can keep chopping away there. So, uh, Dalton, uh, these have been four great ones. Cannot wait to hear number one. Let's let's drop it on us. Let's go. N- number one, we talk about playmakers on defense, but let's take a look at offense. I, and I think a big part of it is you had a couple of NFL-caliber receivers. Of course, Jaden Reed's in the NFL yep. with the Packers. Keon Coleman has NFL talent. He transfers down to Florida State. Uh, at the same time, 
you you had the sense of security maybe for for a lot of MSU fans just with a starting quarterback being back maybe again because you did win 11 games in one year with them uh yeah. back in 2021 and and maybe the the idea of a new quarterback coming in whatever that security was whether authentic or maybe misled whatever it is like that is a question mark and something else that needs to be established in the upcoming year. So I think it's who's going to be the playmakers on offense in the receiving room. Can Trey Mosley step up, not just to be wide receiver number one, but to be a difference maker and, and maybe a game changer in that aspect. Montori Foster, Christian Fitzpatrick, Antonio yeah. Gates back there. Alante Brown comes transferring in from Nebraska. How does that change? I, I think finding out who are going to be some of those big time playmakers in the receiving room is big. And we know about the running backs. You mentioned Jalen Berger earlier. Can Nathan Carter uh, flip a game on its head too? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you don't ever really want to put the bar of K9 on somebody, but sure. In right. some of those flashes, can you can you change a game like that? So I think that's a big thing, too, is who are going to be playmakers on this MSU offense? I, I absolutely love that one. And, like, there's, like, a sub storyline in there that, like, I, I just don't think we're going to find out until maybe week three, for example. It's Agreed. just, like, Alante Brown, like, is he the guy that can take the top off of defense? Because all these receivers have, you know, great strengths amongst them, but Alante was here to be the speed guy. Yep. And if we're hopefully going to go back to pound green pound, you know, a nice power run game, okay, how can you make sure the safeties aren't going to be, you know, basically in the linebacker's back pocket and have someone that, okay, the defense is a little concerned about that could burn a 4 4 40 just down the sidelines. I, but again, like it's tough, tough to find out in practice. But all the other guys, like yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see like what comes out of these practices to see how the pecking order is stacking up amongst the receiver room, the running back room. But one other thing too is like I think Noah Kim. Look, if the season started, you know, on Friday, this Friday, Noah Kim, I think is your starting quarterback. Mm -hmm. Fascinating to know if four weeks are enough time for Hauser to either close the gap completely where he can jump him or. Close the gap enough where we go into that central game where it's going to be like, all right, Kim, you get the first two series, then Hauser the two. Like, how close do you think this quarterback race is, Dalton? I mean, because I, I can't figure it out. Well, and the sense I've gotten from the outside, not based on really much conversation, but it just does kind of feel like momentum's pointing to Kim. So I'm kind of curious about that, too. Now, Mel yeah. Tucker's going to be meeting with the media later this week. And so hopefully okay. we get a little bit more inclination, a little bit more just from his answers to, to kind of pinpoint us to where we're heading there. But I, I mean, we, that was one of the questions we asked him at the big 10 media days. And he spoke very highly of, of both quarterbacks. So I, I think he, he truly does love what he sees in both. I don't like that's just the coach speak as we talked about, yeah. but I, I, for whatever reason, my, my gut is leaning towards Kim as well. Um, and if that ends up being the case, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what that holds too. That's and that's why I keep saying. And I swear I'm not just you know Michigan State slappy. That's looking at everything through green tinted glasses. But like whoever the quarterback rolls out, like I, I'm gonna have like full faith in them. I I really am because look, if it is Kim working backwards here, that means that he beat out the guy that the staff brought on. Like Kim is from the D'Antonio era. Like if this was the the Kim era, that means he like beat any politics that could have been in there was like okay we want to make hauser happy he's our guy we're gonna play him but like so that really showed me something or whereas hauser is the guy well i mean that means that he beat a guy that look I, I know the coaches don't look at this but is minus 200 to win the starting job right now according to las vegas who has never run about anything of course but <laughs> i just I'm, I'm i'm riding into the sunset with, with whoever walks out there not just week one but also like week three i think is really when we're going to find out who is solidly the the quarterback that's that's how i see it, at least i could be wrong well, and a, and a side piece I think is important to note there. We talked about some of those other areas needing to be established around the quarterback, but we've been harping on this offensive line. If this offensive line steps yeah. up in a big way, that should help whether it's Hauser or Kim in, in a big way too because, I mean, just because of depth, that hasn't quite been there. Pass protection's taking a hit. So I, I'm kind of excited to see what a quarterback can do with that line too. Love it, love it. I absolutely love this chat too. I gotta say, like, I started this like on the fence. Like, am I excited for football or like am I gonna miss summer? But like, the, the last half hour has swung the meter like almost all the way over to like, let's kick the season off Friday. Let's let's just do it. Come on, I, I'm pumped to have this back. Fall camp is back. Dalton, I look. I, I I'm sorry. I will be asking you to join the show again. This was a great chat. I had a blast. I hope the listeners and viewers loved it. So uh, I, I'm not gonna beat the brakes off you entirely. I'll wait. <laughs> As much as much as I possibly can, but thanks a lot for joining, man. I, this this was awesome. Really do appreciate you. 
Of course. Thanks for having me, Matt. Can't wait for my next homework assignment. Hey, yeah, there we go. Uh, the top 15 storylines going into the Central Michigan game. I cannot wait for that one. That's going to be electric. But hey, gang, you know where to find Dalton Scheller. Come on. It, it is the Spartan <laughs> Media Network before all the games. Uh, go follow his work at Dalton Shetler as well on Twitter. But hey, until next time, have yourself a wonderful day. Love you all. Go Green.